okay, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. It's a 12 o'clock block, of course. It's lunchtime here on Think Tech. And we're talking about restaurants of Hawaii with Cheryl Matsuoka of the Hawaii Restaurant Association. More specifically, we're talking about how she is, and they are our guests, our uh, Grant uh, Itumat, Itumitsu and Siobhan Garcia, and how they all collectively are working to prepare Hawaii's future chefs. I'm so excited. Cheryl, tell us what you guys are doing. Yes, absolutely, Jan. Thank you so much for having us on. Uh, I'd like to introduce Grant, as you mentioned. He is the pro a professor at the department. I mean, I'm sorry, let me say that again. He is the professor at the Kapiolani Community College, and he is also a department chairperson for the culinary arts. Siobhan Garcia is- I might add, they must eat well down there, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Uh, Cheryl, yeah, what about uh, Siobhan? Yes, and Siobhan Garcia is the executive assistant for the Hawaii Restaurant Association as well as the Hawaii Restaurant Association Educational Foundation. So, Jay, I am also the executive director of the Hawaii Restaurant Association Educational Foundation. And today we're talking about how we are at the Educational Foundation. We abbreviated, we call ourselves EF, Educational Foundation, uh, preparing future chefs here in Hawaii. And I'll go ahead and have Siobhan first cover who the Educational Foundation is, the EF, and then a little bit about our culinary program in our local Hawaii high school. Oh, Siobhan. I can hardly wait. This is so important. You know, it's related, of course, to uh, you know hotels and restaurants that are the main engine of our economy or at least that's the way we want it to be. But it's also another industry. It's another, another expertise, another way of bringing people here and making local people happier than they've ever been. You know, we haven't eaten out all year. So this is, the hope. I hope you can make me hungrier than I, than I am already, Siobhan. That's not gonna be my job. That will be Grant. He'll probably <laughs> be able to best to make you hungry. <laughs> But what we kind of want to talk about is the HRA EF, um, the Educational Foundation, um, and how it supports the hospitality and food service industry in Hawaii through our educational programs. Uh, these educational programs educate and inspire current and future hospitality industry workers, and they support the philanthrop philanthropic missions of the National Restaurant Association, also known as NRA, and the Hawaii Restaurant Association. And part of this educational program is the ProStart program, um, where we're currently in nine high schools. And this program is really to help not only um, inspire, but to give these local kids knowledge that they might not acquire in regular classes. Um, so with that, I'll kind of let Grant go into a little bit more on the ProStart program and how he's been helping. Yeah, please, Grant. I, you know, I, I imagine these kids must love this. They must love those classes. Am I right? Well, we hope so. I mean, that, that's one of our challenges. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so about a year ago, when all, all, everything started happening here at Kapilani Community College, we we're trying to figure out how do we keep our students engaged now that everyone has to be at home? And how do we continue the program so we weren't setting back our students any further uh, than they would have to. And so one of the things we decided to do was, hey, why not create some kind of challenge that we could do online? So the, the premise of the Mad Skills Challenge that the HRA EF is doing is stems from something we did in a small little pilot here at Kapilani Community College. So ultimately what we did was um, decide, you know, I'm sure you, you've seen all those different challenges that come on uh, with all of these social media aspects. And mm -hmm. one of them was we thought, hey, why not every week we come out with a challenge, you know, give a prize away for it, you know, get the students excited. You know, everybody like loves gift cards, right? Um, especially uh, for our students who oftentimes during this time when they, you know, might not be able to have jobs can help out the family. So we thought, hey, why not give them a task? and try to begin to elevate these different tasks as we go from week to week. Not only that, what we also thought about is how do we support the local culinary programs throughout the state? You know, the DOE was challenged. Again, all the, their students were at home. How do we create some excitement so that they get something out of their curriculum? You know, 
they've tried so hard. And, you know, here at Kapilani Community College, we focus on purely culinary. So that's what we do every single day. Now to have the DOH to try to do all the things that they do along with trying to engage students who are not at home. Uh, we thought this was a prime opportunity um, to allow for this math skills challenge. Fabulous. You guys already, you already have a restaurant. Has it been operating during COVID? Uh, actually, it's pretty interesting because we had to pivot as well. So we weren't allowed to have anyone come onto campus here at Kapilani Community College. But so what we ended up doing was doing a curbside service. Uh, so we did have some for lunch and it was, we actually had a very highly successful uh, curbside pickup for PM Continental, which they took regions of European cuisine and we would uh, serve it uh, once a week for people to order and uh, come up and uh, pick it up uh, at our campus. So curbside pickup gave our students the opportunity to kind of pivot the same way the, the rest of the industry was pivoting and at least give them some educational components related to what they may have to see once they step out of the program. Yeah, and now and now you're well at least looking forward to you know reopening. Um, you're going to reopen the restaurant. You have a date in mind, and what, what's going to happen? So right now, with the University of Hawaii, they just most recently mentioned about um, athletics being able to have people come into and you know view their events. So we're kind of on that same timeline. We're trying to wait and see what the, our administration does, what the UH system uh, decides to do in order uh, to move forward. But hopefully um, we'll be able to get that sometime sooner rather than later. Uh, we already know what we see out there in the industry where the industry is already, you know, kind of, you know, pivoted again, you know, to accommodate all these people that are coming in. I know this uh, past weekend for the Memorial Day, um, there were many um, restaurants that were not taking reservations and people were being turned away left and right. Um, so again, we want to be able to pivot very quickly and kind of respond to what we also see out there in the industry. So I told you guys before the show that my wife and I have been watching these uh, shows on Amazon. They're Amazon productions, and there's more than one series right now that Amazon has, um, you know, about about opening restaurants and all the issues and challenges you can have in opening restaurants. And then they have one on, on chefs from all around the world. And each one of these is a fabulous movie. I mean, they're not, they're not just documentaries. They, they want to know how these chefs think. They want to know how they got into being a chef. They want to know how they express themselves through the food. It's, it's so interesting to meet them and, and hear them speak about this in so many different walks of life, so many countries, so many kinds of cuisine, so many, so many fabulous meals everywhere. I mean, if they're trying to make you hungry, they do succeed. <laughs> but what, what, it, what it tells me watching this is that chefs are heroes. Chefs are the leaders of the industry. They create the, you know, the special art form, the special taste experience, which is important to everyone around the world. Uh, some of them are into, you know, street food. Some of them into fine dining. They all have their little specialties. So what I'm thinking, actually, with your program, Bram, um, you could ultimately, sooner than later, make Hawaii a mecca for, what do you want to call it, fusion food, Hawaii and Asian food, American food, whatever it is, every kind of food. And um, you could you could put this on on Amazon or elsewhere, and show the world what kind of um, you know talent we have here, what kind of people we're training, and how well they relate to the food and the and the profession. You know, I mean, I see you as a, a critical organization, and you as a critical individual um, in in making Hawaii uh, worldwide you know a mecca. Of, for good food. I know, I, I know we haven't done it yet, but I think now we can do it. What do you think about that possibility, Grant? I, I mean, I think you're on the right track, you know, and, you know, we have to give credit to all the people that laid the foundation, the Chef Wong's, the Chef Yamaguchi's that yeah. actually allowed us to have this type of um, um, type of uh, education develop. And it's not only at KCC, it's at Leeward Community College, it's at Kauai Community College, at Maui and the Big Island. So all throughout the states, we have our uh, UH 
uh, community colleges putting on these programs that are really doing quite a bit. And there's been so many different accolades that have been awarded uh, uh, to us. And yeah, I, I, you know, what you were mentioning about these chefs having all their unique styles, their unique pathways and how they got into the industry and how they succeeded in the industry. That's here at KCC, that's something we really try to do. Uh, we want to try to make sure that students get that experience. So, you know, we do a lot of partnerships with Hawaii Food and Wine Festival to get their chefs um, all, all throughout the world to come in and be able to share that experience. And, you know, for us, we've had opportunities. I, I can think of one right before the pandemic um, that um, a crew from Japan came in and they uh, sat down with our Asian cuisine class and our chef and our students were able to, um, uh, they were able to document what we do in our culinary program. Of course, everything is in Japanese, but I had it translated for me and they did an amazing job publicizing what they do. And I think for us at the community college level, again, enrollment is a very important aspect of what we need to try to uh, uh, garner. Uh, and that's where HREF comes into play, right? They're, they're starting with the high school, they're starting with the middle school, and they're creating that pipeline that will continue to grow this industry. So uh, to go back to your uh, question, I, you know, there's so many opportunities that we've had. Um, and I think there's unique opportunities that we've had that we've never experienced before. But I kind of like what, you, you know, if Amazon approached us today and said, hey, do you want to do a program? I'll be the first one to sign up there and we'll make it happen. And that's what people in the culinary industry do. They make it happen. They could really use you. I, I know from watching, you know, their their offerings that they would be very interested in having a Hawaii chef or more than one, but different kinds of cuisine, right? We have it all. We have it all right here. But let me ask you more about that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, there used to be a, um, a cooking school, a cuisine. I don't know if they called it Cuisine Institute or something. Um, at the intersection of um, Veritania and uh, Keamoku, I don't know if you remember, and it closed. It closed. It's not there anymore. Grovene, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It had a French name. So I'm, I'm thinking there are people here in Hawaii, and a lot of the the stars in this Amazon, these Amazon series are, they're, they're not kids. They're not, you know, in their teens, twenties, even thirties. They're in their forties, um, and they had a, you know, a, a, a vision. <laughs> of changing their lives <laughs> to do what they really love to do. Enough being a stockbroker, I want to be a chef, that sort of thing. <laughs> Enough being a lawyer, I want to be a chef. And in fact, I know one guy who did exactly that. Um, but if they wanted to train up, okay, big question for you, Ren. If they wanted to train up, could they talk to you? Um, or are you going to tell them, no, 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 university only trains, you know, people who are matriculated. Um, do you have a do you have a program for them to the you know the, the people who have been through a good part of their life, but they want to have um, a, a a great moment in food preparation? Yeah. So one of the things we try to do here at Copyline Community College is look at all different avenues. Um, so we do training uh, with the hotels uh, for people that aren't in culinary and want you know wanted to develop their skills. If there's opportunities for them to move up the ranks, so we work with the Harriet program uh, with that. Um, we had a go cook program, apprenticeship program for students that, you know, wanted to just dabble, you know, a little bit into the culinary aspects to see where they're at and whether, uh, whether or not it's uh, something for them. You know, it's kind of interesting. We're talking about all this uh, Amazon and all these different ways that uh, people learn about the chefs. And one thing we always say is that, you know, what you see on TV uh, is always this, this great story. Uh, but behind it, you know, some of them really take a look at the hard work they have to put in. And I, I guarantee you, every single chef that's out there in the industry will tell you it's not it's not exactly like what you see on TV. That gets gives you the motivation, but you have to continue that. And how do you do that? You go through the education and it could be through Kavilani Community College. It could be through Leeward Community College. It could be through the pro start at the high school level. There's different ways to get to where you want to get to without having to, say, go to college or um, you know, if, if you have the heart, you have, if you have the will, I mean, some of the chefs listen to their story, you know, they're, they just walked into a, a restaurant and say, hey, I want to learn how to cook, will you teach me? And so uh, here at Kapilani Community College, we want to be able to offer many of those experiences. Uh, we also do non-credit. We haven't done, done them more recently because of the current pandemic, but nonetheless, this is something that's a complete picture. We don't look at just um, 
students coming in getting an AS degree in culinary arts. We want them to be, number one, love food, which everyone does, but be passionate about it. Maybe make this a career. And if it doesn't become a career, they become better cooks. And when they become better cooks, they can help out their families, their friends, their health. Um, so there's so much growth that can take place from this. Yeah, this is part of the uh, roaring back, the roaring back of the restaurant tours, you know. But first, I'd like to ask Siobhan a question. Siobhan, what is the relationship of the HRAEF and Kapiolani and the other, the other uh, culinary schools and programs around the state? How do you get funded at HRAEF, and, and how do you share that funding with them? Well, the, the relationship is obviously we want to build that pipeline of these high school kids to go into the Kapilani Community College, the Leeward. We have to try to continue on with all of these new chefs. You know, as far as funding, we do get help from the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation. And this funding come out um, just between our relationship that we have. And we're really there to help this Pro Start program and these students and the instructors. And once we can, you know, we're able to kind of form these relationships and these foundations, that's how we end up in places like Kapilani Community College. Um, so it's- Are been, you a nonprofit? Is the National yeah. Restaurant Association? Whoops, I see yeah. Cheryl shaking her head. She has something to add to that. Cheryl, can you, can yes. you amplify? Yes, yes. The Hawaii Restaurant Association Educational Foundation, what we're calling the HRAEF is a C3. So we are pure nonprofit. And it is a division, as Siobhan had said, from the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation. So the Pro Start curriculum, which is what is in our local high schools, the nine local high schools, is really to prepare the students. And you know, Jay, when I speak to the kids and I say, you know, we had a chili cook off and we had local high schools compete against each other, like, who makes the best chili kind of thing. They got a trophy and they're really honest, right, Grant? They're like, auntie, the reason I'm in this class is I got to go to high school anyway, right? It's a requirement. Why not learn how to cook? And not only that, auntie, but we get to eat in school. So it's a plus for them because whatever they're making, they get to eat. Is there a job for them? Yes. You mean when they eventually come out of high school or even uh -huh. in high school? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if there is opportunity for them to work, one of our board members is Jamba Juice, and he's always looking for, for employees and new talent. So, yes, there's an opportunity for them. Because so this is really playing a tremendous role in the future of the, the restaurant industry, I think. But, but Grant, let me, let me ask you, you know, not every student is a brilliant chef. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I would have to agree with you, you know, but each person comes into our program with this potential to become who they want to be. And for us, that's what we need to do. We need to bring out the best in them. So yeah, not everyone is going to be the top chef, um, but what we can strive to do is help them get to where they want to be. Um, obviously, we're always about being realist, you know, how far um, uh, they want to go. It's entirely up to them because that motivation, I think, is more of a driving factor than any other technique we could teach them. Mm -hmm. um, but for them to be able to understand that, hey, you come into our program, we're going to try to train you as best as we can, get you ready. Um, and you need to take, you know, after we prepare you, give you the basic skills, you need to take that on to the next level. And that's for every student, whether they're our best student we ever had or if they struggle through our program. We always try to help them uh, through the process and knowing that they can be successful through college, they can make it anywhere they want to go. Do you talk to them about specialization? For example, there was this uh, woman, Silverton was her name, on one of those Amazon shows, which I watched recently. Um, and she was uh, already, you know, in her 60s, but she was going strong. She was going to do this the rest of her life. And her specialty, as it turned out, after a, a long and, you know, diverse career in uh, L.A. In, in doing chef work, she settled on pastries and bread baking. She settled on baking, and, and she, she could make a loaf of bread that would mouth, make your mouth water just looking at it. You know, so, I mean, to me, it's probably worthwhile asking them or suggesting to them you know, that they could be expert in something. Do you do that in the course of the school, or do you make them generalists? Yeah, I would say 
our first year is making them generalists, making sure they under, understand the very fundamentals. So, you know, a lot of what we're trying to incorporate now is more the science aspect of this, because, you know, a lot of these things, they could go straight into the industry and learn and get those skills. But uh, what we try to add on to that is some of that critical thinking It's like, OK, so if you're working on a certain method and it's not working out, what is the problem? Well, now they in their mind, they can try to figure out what that problem is and how to solve it rather than, you know, not knowing going to the say, hey, chef, this doesn't work. Tell me how to fix it. Right. So we want to create critical thinkers. So that's kind of our fundamentals area. And then when they go into their second year, that's where they get a little bit more of the advanced. Uh, types of classes that will focus more on, say, in the baking side, patisserie and tatisserie. In fact, what we're trying to do with our program now is try to respond to both the industry side as well as our students by creating these shorter one credit courses that will tie into specialized areas. So, you know, we're culinary school, but hey, why aren't, you know, a lot of our students are now thinking they want to open up their business. They want to sell things on Instagram. They want to be able to take nice photos. So why don't we have a, a food photography class? Why don't we have uh, some social media classes that will help them be successful? And I think that's part of our job is to look at what's out there for opportunities and be able to provide them. And so, you know, being, having, become a, having them become a generalist in the first year is kind of nice because that sets the foundation, but mm -hmm. each person has their relative interest. And again, our job is to kind of guide them towards that area. So I think, you know, moving to these one credit courses not only help our program and our students say, hey, you know what, they're really curtailing this program to me, but also people in the industry that might say, hey, you know what, I don't have time for a full program. But hey, if you have this one month program once a week, one credit, I'll, I'll be the one that first to sign up there, you know, so that's what we're trying to do to be able to provide. Yeah, that's, well, that's very good. Make them rounded, make them rounded. Uh, the woman Silverton last night, I think what was interesting about her is that she was... Uh, OCD, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. This is a woman who'd be making a new recipe for bread at two o'clock in the morning. Um, this is a woman, you know, in her 60s that would do that. Um, and so she was so, so involved, so committed uh, to making it better and better and better through her whole lifetime. And I wonder if you can teach that. I wonder if you can teach the worth work ethic. I wonder if you can teach the you know, how to do a good relationship, a sociological ethic with the other people in the restaurant, in the kitchen, for example, how to be a leader, how to tell them what to do and motivate them, you know, to do their best and not offend them, you know, because that may not be consistent with the way a lot of businesses run. Um, this is hard work. It's a lot of stress. There's deadlines all around you. And there are people who, you know, may not be friendly as you want. and you know, maybe people don't want to listen to you and, and so forth. And so if you want to elevate your career in the kitchen, you have to have all kinds of skills beside cooking. Do you, do you teach them that? That's, you know, when you say that, um, that is, that's a wonderful point to make because you ask any of the restaurants that contact us and want to interview our students. He said, really, all I really want is someone that's willing to learn. And so it's a lot of these soft skills that we have to try to teach our students. Um, and we do it in a, multiple ways, you know, whether it's communication. So we have a lot of competitions that we do where part of it is not only producing, but also speaking to other people, understanding, you know, being able to communicate with them. Um, there, there are a lot of different things that we know that, that creates barriers. So one of the things that um, we use quite a bit is critique. You know, the hardest thing to do is put your food on the table and have it critiqued by someone else. Oh yeah, um, very important because that's the customer. That's the what, cu in fact your your fellow your your co-employee is going to be the toughest customer of all. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know, so being able to you know listen to that feedback and be able to utilize them, you know, and that's always the first most difficult thing somebody's actually critiquing what I put out and I feel like I'm putting out the best. And if you're really passionate about what you, what you do, you're always thinking you're putting out your best, but everybody has their own opinion. Sure they do. Uh, the, so I'm thinking of, um, you know, a meatpacking plant where they all, everybody works together, shoulder to shoulder. They work hard. They breathe, they breathe virus. Um, that's why meatpacking plants in the Midwest, you know, a lot of people have gotten sick over COVID. We have a question from a, 
a, re, a, a viewer, and I need to ask that question for you. I need to also thank the viewer for the question. Okay, he says, or she says, line cooks had a 60% mortality rate during COVID. I, I'm not sure that's true, but that's what the question says. Um, has there been anything put in place to protect future chefs from COVID in an intense working experience like a kitchen? Yeah, I well, well I, I can tell you what we do here at Coffee Line Community College. Um, we implemented very strict policies. And the one thing good about the industry is that cleanliness, sanitation, safety is always number one. So for us to implement anything in addition to that really wasn't very difficult. Now, realize that our kitchens are much larger than most of the kitchens you see out there. Um, and so we're able to do six feet social distancing as much as possible, more so than other areas. But we implemented uh, face shields as part of the requirement, as well as wearing masks, wearing gloves, uh, cleaning um, sanitation, even before we start, uh, during and afterwards. So for those kinds of things, we try our best to mini uh, minimize the risk for obviously in this time for COVID transmission. Uh, at the same time, this is what we normally would do, except for maybe the face shield. So it's not anything we do differently, but when you're working out in the industry, now you have a much smaller kitchen. Uh, people are at a much uh, closer proximity. So again, those lines, those six feet barriers will probably be um, overlapping much more than what you see in the- um, They'll continue for sure. Yeah. Hey, Siobhan, I have a question for you. Now you care a lot about what Grant does because you're, you know, you're interfacing with him on the uh, EF program. And I wonder if you have an idea about what is going to be the future of our, call it the chef industry, the food preparation, food creation industry here in the land of fusion. You know, I mean, uh, people I know, uh, their families grew up on plantations. They like every kind of food you can imagine. It's not ethnic for them. It's everything. And um, you know, I just wonder what is going to sell. What is going to sell best? If I'm in the business of creating, you know, creative food, as every chef on Amazon will tell you, um, what should I be thinking of? What should I be thinking of for the local uh, customer? And what should I be thinking of for the visitor? Grant, I'll give you a chance on this question too. But what do you what do you think? And what are you telling? Grant, because you're a very influential person with Grant. <laughs> well, you know, of course, I think uh, the future, I feel, is really local products. You know, really using our local products to show what Hawaii is about. And I think a lot of the up-and-coming chefs, these kids that we're seeing, really have a passion for local products. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And, you know, when you come to Hawaii as a visitor, a lot of people like to get uh, a sense of what Hawaii is. And I think they're going to start to see more and more of those local Hawaii foods that all of us are very used to. I think we're going to see those start to pop up more. And what about uh, a restaurant like Nobu's, which closed during the COVID? It was one of my favorites. That was fine dining. It was expensive. It was very creative. Tastes there that you wouldn't find anywhere else. I mean, it's a really good, I don't know if they're heard on the mainland or what, but, you know, and that, and that attracted a lot of Japanese because the base of it, you know, the fundamental cuisine was, was Japanese. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm wondering, Grant, let me address you on this. So I'm wondering, you know, isn't that an enormous possibility for us to do fine dining, global fine dining, like you wouldn't find anywhere in the world, finding dining that would uh, supplant or replace uh, Restaurants like Nobu's, where people could speak of us in, on every continent and say that Hawaii really has it together and that it has tastes that are not, not available anywhere else. Yeah, I, I think that's where we have one of the greatest opportunity. I mean, if you think about how Hawaii is such a melting pot, um, and that's come from all the different cultures that are out there. And so to be able to infuse them, and people have done this in uh, so many different ways, you know, I think that gives us a leg up because yes, we have American cuisine. Yes, um, we have the Asian Pacific cuisine. Um, I mean, there's so much opportunity for fusion to happen. And again, I, I don't know if there's 
we could call it a, just a pure Hawaii cuisine, but I think uh, Siobhan is right. It starts with kind of use, utilizing what we have here locally and yeah. be, taking those influence from all these different cultures. Sure, and that's a two-way street because we're encouraging local agriculture and aquaculture and so forth. So, you know, it, it has a huge effect in both directions. Let me ask you this too, circling back to a question I asked you before, not every graduate, not every person who goes through your programs or the other programs at, at UH and wherever else they are, is going to be a global, great global shift. Uh, and as we have discovered, not all of them get the same grades. Some of them get really good grades and some of them you know, not, not as good. So the question is, this is a hard question, but I think we all need to know the answer. How do you spot a great chef in the making? Surely, certainly, it's not just grades. You must be watching these people like a hawk. How okay. can you tell who is going to be a global chef? You know, it's it's really interesting. And for us, um, you know, I you know, I started off here. So my background is in nutrition. I worked in hospitals, and so my class was a science class, science of human nutrition. And I had a lot of these culinary students come in and they struggled because a lot of it is anatomy, physiology, very challenging for them. But then when I see them in their own element, something switches. I mean, they're like mad geniuses um, in what they do. And the one thing that I've noticed and I picked up from some of the other chefs as well is that the students that typically do well will be the ones where the academic is the academic, but you will see them involved in everything outside of academics that's related to food. They will volunteer, they will um, do community service. They will, they, they're, you know, you can tell that this is their passion. So number one, I think they need to find their passion. If they're passionate about something, they will, they will chase it. And so yes, what they do in the class uh, has a, a big impact, but what they do out of the class that promotes the industry or helps them develop their skills. I think that 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 is what sets so many of them uh, apart from some of their peers. Yeah, Grant, that's really great to hear. Cheryl, this must mean a lot to the Hawaii Restaurant Association. Tell us what it means to you and where it takes the Restaurant Association, where it takes the state. First of all, yes, you're right. It totally means a lot to our restaurant industry because the Educational Foundation is preparing Hawaii's future, not only chefs, but all of our future food service employees by providing the Pro Start culinary program in the local high school. And, you know, we have a lot of talent here. We don't want them, Jay, to, to go to the mainland. We want them to stay here and be successful here. So like you said, the EF is focusing on cultivating our local food service workforce. And it's very important to the restaurant industry to keep our local talent here. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Grant. Uh, thank you, Siobhan. Let me only add that um, a lot of the chefs on Amazon take a little time off and they study in Paris. Wouldn't it be something, it's rhetorical, wouldn't it be something if instead of studying in Paris, they came and studied in Hawaii? Nei? That would be something. There's something to work for. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Siobhan. Wonderful discussion. Aloha.